<clears throat> used to contribute to a Spanish magazine and uh, occasionally to the Russian magazine, uh, what's that called, Mineralogical Almanac. And, you know, here and there, little bits here and there. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you take over now. Um, so you're basically you're talking about what it's like to be a photographer. In this yeah, hobby. basically I chose, I put this program together a couple of years ago and it's basically what my life is normally like uh, without COVID. <laughs> <laughs> And, he, and, and and he's had to, he, he does work um, during the Tucson show at our building in Tucson at La Fuente. And we had to come up with a COVID uh, procedure for him to take photographs. So people come to the outside, they drop off their minerals. He goes outside and picks them up and, and the people don't come in the building. So we have had to adjust for that. He takes the pictures and hands them back their specimens. So, so instead of sitting around chit chatting uh, inside our building, they have to wait outside uh, on the patio. Yep, it's it's actually a little more efficient because people can't sit there and yak at me while I'm shooting and ask me a million questions. <clears throat> Especially the tourists who just wander through and see what I'm doing, you know. Yep. <laughs> okay. Or so worse, give you suggestions, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, backseat photographers, they're always welcome. Mm -hmm. Not. <laughs> well, we now, have a little bit of business first. Um, Mary's going to call the meeting to order. Yep. Um, and we've got Bab has joined us. Um, so we're calling the meeting to order at 7 11 p.m. I'm rec we are recording it, so we will have your talk, Jeff available to members to see it will be put on our YouTube channel and on our website so that people can who aren't able to join us will be able to see it. We're doing that with all of our talks nowadays. Um, and the other announcements I have, one, we were kind of already chatting about what we're doing on the outside. We're installing a new shed. We've got a wonderful cement pad that it's going on and we're putting up a 16 by 12 foot uh, size gazebo so we will have an outdoor work area oh, I make it go huh I'll start video mm -hmm. hi there fred Hello. oh there you are <laughs> hi guys and um the we did take a vote of the club on whether or not they wanted to let the existing uh directors and officers stand for the new year and the vote was almost unanimous to let us do it. There was one dissenting vote. I don't know who it is. Uh, so, so that has passed. And Michelle, can you think of anything else we have to announce? Um, I think that you've covered it. I think we, um, we generally talked about the concrete pour. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, Fred, and everyone who was involved. But. Um, especially our concrete guy, Fred. Um, it's just great. It's just so exciting to see the, the club continue to grow even under these strange circumstances. Oh, and we, we, I forget one thing. We are going ahead with the fall festival and we've asked the uh, parking lot trust to, uh, to put us on the calendar for October and they've agreed to let us have the space. So they're just going to get us the contract. So we will be going ahead with that. And there is an announcement that there is going to be some sort of reduced attendance fair for the San Diego fair, but we do not know what that means and if we will have a building and exhibit or what. We There aren't any rules yet. I think it's too early for them to tell us. All they have announced is they're trying to come up with a socially distanced and smaller version of the San Diego Fair. We just don't know what that means. It, what was, it, that came out yesterday. So, oh, and Vista is going to have their show at the Steam Museum uh, next month. And we did put that notice out, but they are getting ready and they will be holding their show because they have an out, it's all outdoors. So they have gotten the 
permits from the county and they will be going ahead with their show. So we should all go out there and support them and have a good time out there because they put in really wide aisles and all the booths are really spaced far apart. And um, I just think it's great. We'll be able to have another show in the area. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the rough and cut? The rough and cut, we don't know exactly what day we're going to be doing it. Um, we're looking at probably sometime in May, but with the new patio area and the new uh, shed and everything, we'll be able to hold it successfully outside without a problem, we're pretty sure. And we'll be making announcements about how we're gonna do that. Because we still wanna make sure that we're doing everything responsibly. We just haven't figured it out how, what, when, because we can't have we can't have it inside like we used to under the old days, because that was a mad rush. And I think there were at least 30 or 40 people in the auditorium. And so that wouldn't be allowed, but we can have groups meeting outside. So if we open the backyard and the side lot and maybe some stuff in the front, we can hold the whole thing outside. So Leah is already planning and sorting and uh, selecting minerals for that. And we will be putting out a call for work parties. Okay, anything else you, anybody can think of? Oh, I guess we are looking at maybe opening the museum. We will also let everybody know when the county gives us the go ahead to do that. It might be sooner than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it, things have been changing rapidly in the last few days and Carol and Michelle and I will be meeting over the weekend to to see what all the latest announcements mean and what the latest rules are and if we have to do any changes before we can open. But I, we're in pretty good shape for doing that. And I think we have to dust everything because nobody's been in that room at all. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Jeff. Um, before we get started with our speaker, I just wanted to make kind of a general announcement. Your video might be better um, when Jeff is speaking. If you stop your video and please considering mute yourself and unless um, Jeff is inviting comments so that we don't interrupt him. And we're recording, so make sure that um, nobody in the background says anything. Yeah. No, no dropping, no kitties pushing over vases, things like that. Okay, Jeff, if you want to take over as host, you can screen share. Okay, well, it's, it's, I just hit the screen share. It says share. Uh, okay, I don't know what I'm supposed to do from here. Um, hold on a second. Let me bring up my program is all ready to rock and roll. There it is. Can you guys see it yet? Looks great. You can see it, okay. We'll play from the start. Is this visible to everybody? It is, Jeff. It looks really nice. Good. Yeah, it looks good, Jeff. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so, a little introductory material. Um, born in Denver, and my father was a geologist, oil geologist. He didn't stick with it very long, but uh, I think that weird hammer that he had and some of the rocks he had lying around. Uh, had an early negative impact on me, got me interested in minerals and mineral collecting. But uh, at the age, a tender age of six, I moved back to Connecticut, uh, where my father had gotten a job with his uncle. Anyway, so I grew up in Connecticut and uh, started collecting at about the age of eight and collected uh, mostly around Connecticut, but a few other New England states. And then uh, I did start off as a geology major. But I switched to uh, basically anthropology and archaeology and museum work. And I uh, went to grad school, moved out west to go to graduate school uh, at Arizona State after having worked on an archaeological dig, a Pueblo site in northwest New Mexico, where I was the laboratory photographer. And this is where I kind of learned close up photography, photo macrography. And uh, after doing that for about three years, I said, hey, let me try these techniques on minerals. And it became a serious um, uh, addition to my mineral collecting, just photographing minerals for myself and other people uh, eventually. And then I decided to uh, 
probably start publishing a few articles in Rocks and Minerals about mineral photography, photographing for other people who are doing articles for mineralogical record, Rocks and Minerals, et cetera, and getting paid in minerals. And uh, after various, uh, I never really went into archaeology or museum work, but after a while I, uh, uh, I oh, I had uh, several different business ventures and uh, was starving to death and decided uh, to, I, I should try this mineral photography, which my, uh, my foot was in the door. And uh, that was 1990. And as they say, the rest is history. So I've been doing this professionally now for 30 years and unprof 31 years and non-professionally for 15 years before that. So I get a few years behind me in mineral photography. So <clears throat> what this present presentation is, is kind of a typical year in my life, pre-COVID, and uh, starting off the first of the year, I do photography in my home. I have a studio that I built, a separate studio in the backyard, but probably about 95% or more of my photography is done on the road. Minerals can be heavy, they can be expensive, they can be delicate, owners can be paranoid and protective. So generally I go to where the minerals are. Uh, of course, I get into related things too, like jewelry, gemstones, uh, fossils. And uh, so anyway, starting off the year, photographing in my own studio, this is a pendant with uh, uh, tanzanite, moonstone, sapphire, and gold by a fellow who was a local artist for a while, Beau Solier. Um, and uh, well, that's his business name. So typical sort of thing shooting some jewelry at, at, at my home. This is probably back in January. Uh, this, by the way, this year I've chosen uh, to represent is 2015, so five years ago. But uh, things haven't changed too much since then. Uh, also in my studio back in January, uh, there's a, a Native American artist that I shoot for occasionally named Emery Omsete. So this is a ring of coral and gold that I shot for him. And uh, I spend, I've, I've estimated, I average about 235 days on the road every year. <clears throat> I used to say, obviously I'm not married, but I am now, second time around. And uh, she's pretty tolerant and accepting of, uh, of my traveling. Sometimes even gets to go with me. Anyway, so my first road trip of the year this was to, I went to uh, Fallbrook, California. Whoa, you probably know this fellow here, uh, Bill Larson. And uh, I usually shoot for him once or twice a year. And uh, so this is a beautiful wolfenite in his collection from the Tsumeb mine. It's 6.3 centimeters high. For those of you who are metrically challenged, there are about two and a half centimeters per inch. So this is a little over two and a half inches high. Beautiful piece. Also at Bill's that year, this was a really neat copper. They call it uh, the fish or the fish skeleton. And it is from uh, uh, his no, nothing more specific than the, uh, than the copper district in Michigan. It's 4.8 centimeters across. <clears throat> so uh, another shot for, for Bill. This is a spinel, a blue spinel from the Ratnapura district in Sri Lanka and uh, 1.8 centimeters high. One of the techniques that I got into using probably about six years ago is called focus stacking. I'm not gonna explain how focus stacking works, but basically it means that the entire specimen is in focus from front to back with, and is sharper than a straight up shot of the piece. And uh, wonderful technique. Um, Back in the day, if I shot something this small, 1.8 centimeters is about three quarters of an inch or so, uh, it would not have been, maybe not even a fourth of this would have been in focus, but it's sharp as attack front to back. Um, the wonders of digital photography. Uh, another piece from Larson's collection, rhodochrosite from the famous uh, Sunnyside mine in Southwest Colorado. And uh, near Silverton, nine centimeters across, very typical for this area, opaque, uh, pink crystals, quite lovely. Also a Bill's collection, this is a pyrite perched on quartz from the spruce claim up in King County, Washington. It's nine centimeters high. And uh, yes, it does look like it's, a, it's not real. It looks like it's been faked, but it has not. 
is the only is not the only one of these I've ever photographed. It seems to happen with some frequency up at that locality. Wonderful, amazing um, pieces from this this uh, this location. Also in Bill's collection, this is a Heliodor, doubly terminated, slightly etched. Heliodor is the yellow variety of beryl. This is from uh, the famous Teofilo Otoni locality uh, uh, near the city of Teofilo Otoni in Minas Gerais, Brazil. 8.4 centimeters across. The crystal is close to flawless. Um, <clears throat> hop, skip, and jump to the west. Probably a number of you know uh, uh, Gloria Olson of Don and Gloria Olson, uh, collectors and mineral dealers, and they live over in Bonsal. So this is a nice little malachite from the coal shaft in Bisbee, Arizona, six centimeters high. <clears throat> Came out of a collection that they had bought uh, shortly before. Pretty neat from any locality, but uh, particularly neat from an, an atypical of Bisbee. Uh, a little bit to the north of LA is a collector by the name of Robert Hesselgesser. And uh, he particularly likes copper and uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan minerals. So this is a little guy, it's only two centimeters high, about three quarters of an inch. It's from the White Pine Mine in Ontonagon County, Michigan. Uh, this was a stack shot too. Another one from the Hesselgesser collection. This is Goethe from Santiolali in Chihuahua, Mexico, 9.5 centimeters across. These are always fun to photograph because of their, their uh, globular botryoidal shape and the way they reflect light and your lights in all different directions. So they can be a challenge to photograph. This is a copper from the Rubsovskoya mine in the Altai Mountains of Russia. This location came online about, oh, I can't remember what it was, maybe 12, 15 years ago, producing beautiful copper cr crystals and clusters, as well as superb uh, cuprite crystals. Anyway, <clears throat> 12 centimeters across. Now from there, I went over to the coast and Laguna Beach. And uh, I photograph occasionally for Wayne and Donna Light, whose business is known as Cristali. They have a nice little shop right down there in the coast highway. And this is a view from their home, uh, looking over the bay. Nice place to hang out, you know. Uh, sometimes the places I stay at are not quite as nice as this. Spectacular views over the Pacific Ocean. <clears throat> and uh, this is a gypsum I photographed for them from Bo Becker in Tuisit, Morocco. 13.6 centimeters high, so that's uh, not quite, maybe five, five and a half inches what they call a uh, ram's horn habit. Really neat silver. This is from uh, the Dukat mine in uh, uh, Magadanskaya Oblast, Russia. An oblast in Russia is roughly equivalent to a state here in the US. Um, 7.8 centimeters across. Also from the Lice collection, this is silver from the Veda Grande mine in Zacatecas, Mexico. 8.5 centimeters high. And <clears throat> a twinned calcite, one of the classic butterfly twins as they're called, from the Big Rig Mountain, Egremont, Cumbria, England, 11.7 .7 centimeters wide. It's pretty rare I will do something like this and put my hand in there for scale. But I did two shots of this, one with and one without the hand. So for the purists who don't want my mitt in there, uh, they can be happy seeing it, uh, you know, without the without the fingers. But the neat thing is, it doesn't show just scale. It also shows the incredible transparency of the crystal. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who are familiar with Wayne and Donna's ads, they have an ad. It's usually the inside front cover of the mineralogical record for many many years, and the ads for a long time until they retired were done by uh, a photographic pair. Uh, Harold and Erica Van Pelt. So they asked me to do something similar. And this is in Wayne's office downstairs at his home. So, <clears throat> excuse me, an assay kit from Freiburg, Saxony, Germany. Um, let me see. I think this is finally, I've, I've made it to the Tucson show in late January of that year. And uh, Wayne Sorison is a uh, collector of larger cabinet specimens from up in Idaho and uh, very fine quality minerals he collects. 
So this is a, a rotocross site, classic piece from the Sweet Home Mine in Alma, Colorado. It's 13 centimeters across and the black material is tetrahedrite. Um, Mark Miterman is, is uh, partners with uh, Evan Jones and, and uh, mineral collecting and mineral sales uh, company. This is a wonderful piece in Mark's collection of malachite from the star of the Congo mine in Katanga, Democratic Republic of the Congo, 15.3 centimeters high. Some of you may not remember the, uh, recognize the name of star of the Congo. It usually is referred to uh, uh, in its French word name, which would be Etoile du Congo. So if you ever see that somewhere and say, well, are these the same mine? Yes, they're the same mine. Also from Mark's collection, one of the classic sceptered elbite tourmalines from Baja dos Salinas in Minas Gerais, Brazil, 7.3 centimeters high. This is pretty good size for this locality. They usually are maybe half that size. Now, um, most of you may know Wayne Thompson. Wayne is sort of semi-retired now as a major high-end dealer. And uh, one of his passions besides prehistoric pottery are uh, Native American baskets. And uh, one of his sub-collections in the baskets is, are uh, trays um, from Apache mostly in the Southwest. So anyway, this is a 23 and three quarter inch diameter tray from Wayne's collection. Uh, Wayne just published a book recently along with Gene Myron, another well-known mineral collector on the really superb quality baskets that come from up around the California Nevada border just uh, in the area of Reno. You're gonna get a hand, your hands on that book. It's a wonderful book. With mostly photographs by, I don't know, some guy from Phoenix. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, back to my place after the show. This is a beautiful ring again by Beausolier of uh, indicolite tourmaline with gold. And it's the, the tourmaline is 1.35 carats and uh, from somewhere in Minas Gerais, Brazil. Um, Paul Farmer is the owner of this company, does all the work. And one of his specialties is called granulation. If you look at that ring closely, you see a good part of the, uh, the mount is covered with little tiny beads. And that technique is called granulation. Very few goldsmiths do it anymore. It's not easy. So um, another well-known collector, Tony Ponacek, lives up in the mountains in Arizona, used to be in the Phoenix area. Anyway, he did a lot of collecting up in the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho and was doing an article on locality. So I shot some nice pieces for him. This is field collected by Tony, a nice aquamarine, 3.2 centimeters high. Um, actually, no, we're still at the Tucson show, come to think of it. Anyway, Metatorbernite. Uh, there was a collector um, whose name I, escapes me at the moment, who was working in Zambia about 30 years ago. And there's a mine there, not very well known uh, to most collectors called the Inchanga Open Pit in Chingola. And he was working there as a geologist and they were coming out with some pretty amazing copper minerals, uh, including cuprite and torbernite, metatorbernite. So he showed up at the Tucson show in 2005 with some mind-blowing azurites, cuprites, and metatorbanites that were very quickly scarfed up by collectors. Anyway, this was bought by Alex Schaus, who is uh, one of the top thumbnail collectors in the country. It's 2.4 centimeters wide, so just under two inches. That's also a stack shot. Another fellow was Patrick Meyer, and uh, he lives in, um, uh, I don't remember, anyway, somewhere in East Africa. And uh, he specializes in the minerals of Southern Africa. And he's particularly crazy about the Ahoite and Papagoite included quartzes from the Messina mine in the Popo province, uh, South Africa. This one is nine centimeters wide. I photographed many pieces for them for him and he did an article on the locality of mineralogical records several years ago using my photos. Uh, another guy comes to see me regularly is a Jim Cutter dealer from Canada. Um, McCloskey Laboratory, a lapidary, uh, and they do really interesting um, uh, cuts, cabochons primarily. And this is an ametrine from the Anahi mine in Bolivia, 222.2 carats, a gorgeous thing. Also at the mine, I mean at the show, I photographed this great 
Broshantite from the Milpias mine in Cuitaca, Sonora, Mexico. It's from uh, John White collector, collection. John White, Mo, some of you may know, is the retired curator of gems and minerals of the Smithsonian. Um, <clears throat> the Milpias mine, uh, most of you probably know, has been producing incredible, some of the world's best azurites and definitely the world's best Broshantites uh, for about 10 years or more now. And uh, amazing material. This particular group is 5.4 centimeters wide. I've done a lot of shooting for the through the years for the Collector's Edge. They brought me this piece at the show. This is Dioptase on quartz from Kalkavelt in Namibia, uh, 11 centimeters across. I believe this is now in the Jim and Gail Spann collection. Uh, as uh, a company at the time known as Sanoble and Brill, which is the name of the two uh, people who ran it at the time, they specialize in large colored gemstones. So starting left to right, we have a spinel. Well, left to right, front row, spinel, chrysoberyl, back row, tourmaline, and sovereite, which is a green grossular garnet. The largest stone there is 19.46 carats. At the AGTA show that year, they had a, uh, the Smithsonian had a wonderful display of sapphires from Montana. And uh, I got to uh, um, sneak in after hours and get a bunch of stuff, bring them to my hotel room, shoot them. And at 3.30 in the morning, finally drag them back to the show <clears throat> and uh, after photographing them. And this is one of the pieces that was done by Paula Crevache. It's misspelled on the slide there. Uh, it's Crevache with a V, not an F. Anyway, all the stones in this uh, pendant or this brooch are Montana sapphires. Wonderful piece, 8.4 centimeters wide. And this is a selection of rough um, alluvial um, sapphires that come out of the Montana uh, sapphire fields out of the river gravels. The largest crystal there is 1.2 centimeters. So that's a hair under half an inch off in the Smithsonian Institute collection. Another guy I've been dealing with for a while is, uh, um, well, I can't remember the name of it, his name off the top of his head, but anyway, he's working with the local um, indigenous uh, Inuit of um, Greenland. And they're mining a deposit where they're coming up with a very rare mineral called tugtopite. Most of you may know tug to pipe because it's highly uh, fluorescent. And it is also, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the term. Uh, anyway, senior moment. Um, basically what happens is if you put this material in the dark for a good while, like overnight, you take it out, it is a much different shade of this red. And as it's, you can see it as it's sitting in the light change to a, uh, a much, um, uh, I think, um, I'm trying to remember which way it goes, darker shade of uh, this pinky red. Anyway, interesting material. And the locals are not only mining it, but they're cutting it, polishing it, faceting it, cabbing it, making jewelry out of it, such as you see here. Anyway, the, the small stone there in the middle is 1.22 carats. This is an interesting piece. This was a skull, fairly accurately, carved skull carved from a piece of the Gibeon Namibia meteorite. It weighs over 50 pounds and is quite accurate in the way it's been carved. And this was brought to me by Artifactual, a company that does all of those carvings you see in fossil walrus ivory from uh, Bali. Pretty neat piece to photograph. A uh, collector up in um, Southeast Indiana, field collector named Harris Precht, Done a lot of work in the, mid, uh, the Midwest. This is a Celestine from the Holloway Quarry in Newport, Michigan that he brought me to photograph. It's 12.3 centimeters high with some minor calcite attached. Amazing piece. All of those Celestine crystals are doubly terminated. Now this is back at home, finally, after the show. Anyway, a couple of wedding, wedding rings. A company called Men's Tungsten Online makes these things. It's, it's, I guess it's kind of the hot thing to do these days to... Uh, make jewelry out of tungsten now. So this is tungsten and the band around the middle of it is more of that give me on meteorite. So a little shot I did for them, for them to use in uh, publicity. 
Anyway, a local collector, well-known, very nice guy named John Lucking, brought me this piece. It's, it's rather atypical for the locality, but it's silver from Kongsberg, Norway, 6.3 centimeters across. Normally, they're pretty much freestanding wires, but this one's a nice little cluster. And if you look closely, you see there are tiny little um, acanthite crystals growing on the surface of it here and there. So back to Southern California. Uh, spent some time shooting for Cal and Kareth Graber there. And uh, this is a exquisite, um, an exquisite Lagrandite thumbnail, 1.8 centimeters high from the Ojuela mine in Kareth Graber's collection. Kareth specializes in only Mexican minerals. A little bit to the south in San Diego, well-known collector Irv Brown, and he has no specialization except in fine specimens. So this is a beautiful zone fluoride from the Yaogangqian mine in Hunan, China, nine centimeters high. And I headed up north, and uh, some of you may know of Dr. Steve Smale. Steve is probably the preeminent mathematician in the world and a uh, retired professor at University of California, Berkeley, and a uh, superb collection, just an amazing collection. Generally, I go up to his place once a year and spend about a week shooting for him. Anyway, a beautiful stib night from the Wuling mine in Jiangxi, China, 26.1 centimeters high. So that is a little over 10 inches. Also in Steve's collection, these are uh, a great example of the barites that came out of the Mikkel mine some, oh, 20 years ago or so now, 7.1 centimeters high. And uh, rare mineral cubanite, cyclic twin from the Henderson number one mine in Chibugamu, Quebec, Canada, 5.7 centimeters high. These are always photo fun to photograph because it's great bringing out the luster and that cyclic twinning that's so evident on the, uh, the main face of the crystal there. Some of you may recognize this. This shot was the poster <clears throat> for the Westward Look Show um, back, I think, in 2016. Uh, anyway, one of those bizarre tabular um, barrel aquamarines with muscovite and a little bit of uh, Considerate peeking out from the right side there. And uh, 9.2 centimeters high. Also Steve's collection. This is the Morganite variety of uh, barrel with smoky quartz and albite and a little bit of lapidolite from Kunar province, Afghanistan. 12 centimeters across. Just a little ways north of the Bay Area there is a collector by the name of John Sigerman. He tends to collect thumbnails and small miniature or toenail size pieces. This is a beautiful Shigaite with rhodochrosite from the Enchuaning II mine in North Cape Province, South Africa, 3.1 centimeters across. Well, from there, I traveled over the mountains to Reno. And Reno it located uh, the um, uh, the shop of Scott. Worski, known as the Miner's Lunchbox. And this is just a photograph of uh, his um, uh, display and area, sales room. And uh, he doesn't have too many walk-in clients, so I just set up right here in this room, turn down the lights and take pictures for him. So one of the shots I did for him was, this is gold from Round Mountain, Nevada. And uh, Round Mountain, mine. This, Scott was one of the major conduits for the goals that were coming out of the Round Mountain Mine a number of years ago when they were still allowing stuff to go out. Anyway, 8.3 centimeters high. Amazing stuff from that mine. Um, same town, our collectors Neil and Cami Pren. They specialize in collecting quartz and uh, Nevada minerals. So this is a beautiful Japan Law twin um, quartz from the Ensign. Yanasano quarry in Atremu, Madagascar, 9.5 centimeters high. Now I'm trying to think when I shot this. Anyway, this is another gold from the Round Mountain Mine. And this is in the collection of Keith and Mana Proctor. Keith passed uh, several years ago now. Um, 
and his collector collection was consigned to the collector's edge to sell. So if you're lucky, you might still be able to own uh, a Keith Proctor specimen. Anyway, this particular piece is 6.7 centimeters wide. Um, I probably, I think from, from Reno, I, I drove to a, um, Colorado Springs where Keith and Mana live. Anyway, a little bit later, I was working on the uh, photography for the Midwest Mineralogical Record Collector Supplement. So I went up to uh, just outside St. Paul and I was collecting for Deborah Roman. And uh, this is her display area, that uh, collection area that she shares with, yeah, shares with her husband who collects insects, primarily beetles, primarily tiger beetles. Those gray cabinets to the right are filled with hundreds upon hundreds of preserved samples of tiger beetles of different species from around the world. So this is a little piece from her collection, another Morgan eye from Patch, Kunar province, Afghanistan, 9.7 centimeters across. From there, I went down to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio and were, did a little shooting for Terry Heising. Uh, Terry's wife, uh, Marie is editor of the uh, Rocks and Minerals magazine. Anyway, Terry uh, specializes in Midwest, but primarily in um, calcite. So this is a neat calcite with amethyst from the La Delicia mine in Artigas, Uruguay, 17.3 centimeters high. Um, it was Terry, along with somebody else, might've been Harris Precht, I'm not sure, who discovered the famous locality for Millerite at the U uh, US 27 road cut in Hall Halls Gap, Kentucky. Uh, there you also get a mineral called honosite. And uh, this is honosite, one of the little geodes, 2.5 centimeters high. So from there, I head a little bit west and a little way southwest of St. Louis is the home of uh, Dave and Diana Weinrich. Diana has since passed away, um, but Dan Weinrich um, has a fine collection, primarily Midwest. This is calcite from the Sweetwater Mine, Reynolds County, Missouri, 19.7 centimeters wide, so almost eight inches. These are bizarre. The Buick Mine in Reynolds County, Missouri has produced these bar um, galenas. And uh, this one's a little, little less barry than usual, but quite long and thin. Anyway, 31 centimeters high, that means it's just over a foot long. And do not ask me how I stood it up. Anyway, <clears throat> while I was at the Weinrichs, another local collector by the name of Joel Perl Perlmutter brought over pieces and he likes to collect, uh, do rough and cuts. And it's always fun photographing a rough and cut. So here we have a Spessartine garnet on uh, shoral tourmaline with albite and quartz from the famous Little Three Mine in Ramona. California, and uh, the specimen is four centimeters high and the stone is 5.20 carats. Well, from there, I headed up to uh, Jeffrey Whaley's place. He lives just outside of, um, uh, well, he's in Northwest Ohio. Anyway, um, he likes to collect big pieces, big pieces, like a foot across and more and uh, particularly calcites and Southern Illinois material. Anyway, nice fluorite with galena from the Hill of Ledford mine in Hardin County, Illinois, 21.2 centimeters high. So that makes it about eight and a half inches. So moving a little bit to the east, just Southwest of uh, Cleveland is uh, collector Mike Marino. And this is a beautiful specimen of mal a malachite pseudomorph after azurite from the Campbell shaft in Bisbee. 5.8 centimeters high. Uh, another piece from his collection, uh, the classic purple fluorites on dolomite from the Elmwood Mine, Smith County, Tennessee, 10.9 centimeters wide. And <clears throat> um, I believe from there, I went to the, uh, I, I don't remember whether I went home or not, but anyway, I uh, went to the um, Springfield, Massachusetts show. So it's called the East Coast Gem and Mineral Show. And, <coughs> oh, gotta get a drink of water. A fellow by the name of Jeffrey Morrison has opened, reopened the old Havy mine in Poland, Maine, and is mining it very successfully for crystals and cutting rough, cutting material. So 
this, uh, the crystal is three centimeters high and brought to me at the Springfield show. Um, <clears throat> Jim Gable is a collector, again, lives just southwest of Cincinnati. And uh, he likes me to stop by whenever I'm traveling through. He specializes in, in fluorite and Southern Illinois minerals. So this is a beautifully zoned fluorite on barite from the Minerva number one mine in Hardin County, Illinois, 8.8 .8 centimeters wide. By the way, if anybody can make it to the Springfield show next summer, Jim Gable is the featured collection collector. He will have 50 cases filled with his amazing collection. <coughs> Lord, <coughs> talking too much. No one's ever accused me of that. Anyway, gem variety of grossular garnet variety sovereign. Here you see a range of colors. This is from the original locality, the Scorpion Mine in Taita, Kenya. It's right on the border with Tanzania. And it, uh, the largest stone there in the far left is 25.01 car carats. I photographed it for mine owner, um, Bruce Bridges of Bridges Sovereign. And uh, Bruce now lives with his wife and children in Tucson, but he's constantly going back and forth to Kenya, Tanzania, and other places for his business of gemstones. Now, yeah, no, I was not at the Springfield show. Oh, I might have shot that, that, that tourmaline group for the Havy group at the Rochester Symposium in New York, which I go to in of April every year. Anyway, <clears throat> every summer, June, July, I spend about six weeks traveling in Europe with the excuse being going to the St. Marie show in, in Alsace, France. But I usually get there uh, several weeks before the show starts so I can travel around doing work for clients around Europe. Uh, for several years, I went uh, a month earlier than usual, early May, and I spent a month photographing in uh, the town of Tübingen, Germany, which is a little way south of Stuttgart. And this is a nice little scene of the local castle here at Tübingen. And uh, this fellow uh, that I shoot for is called Gregor. He's Professor Gregor Markle, a mineralogist at the University of Tübingen. And he collects primarily minerals of the Black Forest and probably has the most extensive collection from there uh, in the world. And he uh, put out a four volume work, each one a doorstop on the minerals of the, uh, the Black Forest. The castle is now an art gallery. Uh, well, part of it's an art gallery, part of it is an archeological uh, museum, a wonderful place to visit if you can ever get there. A view from the castle. This is the Neckar River in Tübingen. I would love to go down here in evenings after I have finished shooting for the day, get myself a nice gelato at one of two competing gelaterias, and then sit on the edge of the uh, Neckar River. And this is neat. It's kind of Germany's answer to Venice. You have these wonderful boats that the tourists like to clamber into, and these guys pull you up and down the river a little bit. And uh, among these beautiful scenery of a wonderful old classic, uh, very old buildings. Uh, in St. Michael's Church, this is the crypt. Wonderful, wonderful. This is a carving, a life-size carving of whoever it is that is buried in that, uh, we'll call it sarcophagus beneath the carving. Beautiful place to travel around. Just outside of uh, Tübingen is a small town called Babenhausen that had a uh, that has a uh, what used to be a um, monastery. Um, it was taken over by one of the local kings back in the 1800s and turned into basically a hunting lodge. It's still open, and you can go through the compartments and see uh, all the furnishings as they were left by that local king. And uh, tour throughout the, uh, the church here. It's a wonderful place. Now, this is about the point where people start saying, do you need help carrying your baggage or anything next time you go to Europe? I'll consider it, but it's probably not going to happen. Anyway, views inside <coughs> the monastery. And these are some of the living quarters 
of the king. This is not the king. I say he's probably the king of Black Forest Minerals, but this is Professor Gregor Markel posing in front of his, some of his collection. Anyway, silver from the Tiefengraben quarry in the Reinertzau, Germany, 4.6 centimeters across. <clears throat> Most people don't think of fluorite when they think of Germany, but <clears throat> There are phenomenal fluorite localities in Germany, particularly in the Black Forest, and in a range of colors from colorless to yellow to uh, purple, um, green, and even blue. This is from the Heselbach mine in Oberkirch, Germany. Cerusite crystals from the Herrensägen mine, and uh, 0.8 centimeters is the largest of those clusters. And you want to see blue fluorites. They don't come from just France and Southern Illinois. This is also from the Hesselbach mine, 11.2 centimeters high. Uh, one day I took a little field trip to a nearby castle. This is a famous Burg Hohenzollern mine in nearby Bissingen, Germany. Went up there, we didn't just take pictures from below, went up and toured throughout the whole castle, wonderful place. <coughs> um, anyway, from there, I went to Luxembourg and Luxembourg is the National Museum of Natural History of Luxembourg. And uh, this is not the museum itself, but some of the offices and laboratory facilities. And I've been there a number of times uh, photographing for the museum. And this is just a view of the, the river running through the middle of Luxembourg. And some of the specimens I photograph for them, this is Metatorbanite from Redruth, Cornwall, England. The largest of those crystals is 0.3 centimeters. So we're talking only about an eighth of an inch. Nice Japan Law twin quartz from a uh, crystal mine in Brazil, 29.1 centimeters wide, so almost a foot. Um, anyway, from there, I went down to Mainz, Germany. There's a friend of mine named Roger or Roger Lang. And <clears throat> he's a collector, dealer, and his business is designing displays for museums, primarily minerals. So this is a small display he had just finished doing for a local um, museum. And uh, this is nearby where uh, uh, his girlfriend Uta lives in Gau Algesheim. Go there and lovely sitting there drinking coffee, beer. Uh, I don't do either one or having some gelato. So this is a piece from his collection. Nice tourmaline, albi tourmaline with lipidolite and lipidineurum mine, 9.7 centimeters in height. <coughs> Uh, from there, this is uh, the meeting place. If you ever go to the St. Marie show, um, this is, these are the front steps of the town's theater. And many of the top end dealers are in the theater. I work in a room in the basement, but when the show is really cranking, this is where everybody hangs out and gets in everybody's way trying to get in and out of the theater. But most of the show is outdoors under little uh, tents, uh, as you see here. And you can wander around for days just enjoying minerals, fossils, mining lamps, gems and jewelry, you name it. It's a wonderful, wonderful show. The countryside's amazing. Superb food, food in all the neighboring towns and in the town of St. Marie Almin. This is a special display they had that year on minerals of uh, um, the Alps. So this is the lovely basement studio that I share with uh, Louis-Dominique Bale, who is publisher, editor of the French mineral magazine, La Reine Minerale. He has yet to arrive. He would take up that, that table in the back. So I, I'm down here for about a week taking pictures for dealers, collectors, museums, what have you. So a few shots I did there that year. This is Moss Agate Cabochon from Madhya Pradesh, India, 69 millimeters across from Indus Valley Commerce. This is the year those wonderful coppers came out of Bounahas Bo in Erachidia, um, Morocco, 2.9 centimeters across. Um, Polish mineral dealer, a group called Spurfer brought these things out. Uh, this is another piece from Spurfer, fluoride from La Viesca mine in La Collada, Astoria, Spain, 8.61 centimeters across. 
albi tourmaline from the Petunera mine, 7.8 centimeters wide, so that's a little over three inches. This is from French dealer, mineral dealer, Brice Gobain. Another French dealer well-known is uh, Frédéric Esco. And uh, this is a fluorapatite with fluorite from the Panasquera mines in Portugal that he brought me that year, 9.3 centimeters wide. And these came out this year for the first time, wonderful Vivianites uh, from Huanuni. I mean, they produce Vivianite for years, but this, they hit a wonderful series of pockets with short, uh, very tight clusters of beautiful, beautiful green Vivianites. This one was bought by Evan Jones of Unique Minerals. It's, 20, it's 12 centimeters across, so not quite five inches. Uh, one of my uh, good friends from Peshawar, Pakistan is Shafi Muhammad, a very good mineral dealer. And he brought me this wonderful spodumene variety kunzite from Mawai, Lakhman province, Afghanistan, 9.8 centimeters high. Back at home in July, I photographed for a local jeweler who specializes in engraving uh, by the name of Kit Carson. Believe it or not, that's his name, Kit Carson. This brooch made out of silver with opal, moonstone, and gold, 11 centimeters high. <clears throat> and uh, let me see. I think here maybe I did finally make it to the East Coast show. Bill Severance is a collector from Pennsylvania. This is a beautiful dioptase from his collection from the Sumat mine, 2.4 centimeters wide. Yeah, definitely, Springfield show. Anyways, this is always held, I believe, the first, first or maybe second weekend of August in Springfield, Massachusetts, West Springfield, actually. Anyway, a, a find of very nice zone amethyst was made in uh, Withy Hill, Moosup, Wyndham County, Connecticut. That's Northeast Connecticut. Uh, by Jason Baskin, a New Jersey collector, 2.3 centimeters high. I shot a number of these for him that, that summer. And uh, anyway, from the show, I headed up north. Some of you may have heard of a new museum. Oh, this is not, no, this is not the same museum, excuse me. The Maine State Museum in Augusta, Maine, uh, is a wonderful museum with all sorts of historical stuff and whatnot on the, on the state of Maine. Anyway, this is a carving done in Germany of <clears throat> a parrot, a parrot. It's made of elbite, tourmaline, quartz, and gold. All of the tourmaline is from the Dunton mine in uh, Newry, Maine, 7.3 centimeters high. This is all out of the material that came out when they hit that giant pocket back in, I think it was 72 or 72, I think, 72 or three. From the Maine State Museum, this is one of the tourmalines that uh, came out of that big pocket. 7.7 .7 centimeters high. And uh, this is the main state tourmaline necklace. All the, the uh, stones are, are tourmalines mined in Maine. The gold came out of, uh, was placer gold from <coughs> um, rivers in Maine. The largest stone, or uh, the total weight of all the tourmalines there is 54.74 carats. Um, anyway, from there, I headed south to Maryland. A collector down there named, by the name of David Dinsmore. <clears throat> and this is a piece from his collection. Of course, the classic Smoky Quartz Albite and Amazonite from the Smoky Hot Claim in Teller County, Colorado, 11.4 centimeters wide. A friend of his came over by the name of George Koenig. Uh, this is a great Venedonite from Mibladen. Morocco, 6.5 centimeters wide. And just across Chesapeake Bay in Delaware, collector Ed Strickler, who specializes in azurite of all things. Uh, Marinci azurite, 2.3 centimeters high. Well, from there, you can tell I zigzag around the country. You can't always do the most logical time and gas saving route that you want have to work with the availability of the client. <coughs> anyway, elbite tourmaline with lipidolite from the Petronera mine. This is some of the early material that came out before Danny Trinchilla got involved with the project. Anyway, wonderful piece, uh, eight centimeters high from Green Mountain Minerals that's run by Dylan Stolowitz. 
Okay, we're starting to head back east. I mean, back west. Uh, Steve Neely is a very well-known collector who is a orthopedic surgeon, lives outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, this is a fluorite from Rimbas Mach, North Cape Province, probably the largest single crystal I've seen them from there so far. It's 11.3 centimeters high. Used to belong to German collector Marcus Budiel. So this is a group of Elbaite tourmalines from Nigeria. The, the total weight is 98.19 carats. This was photographed for Barker and Company. They are a Scottsdale based importer and cutter. <clears throat> and this shot, I think, ended up being the cover of an English gemology journal. Moving on to the Denver show. So we're into September. So don't get don't get too antsy here. We're we're only a few way, uh, months away from the end of this uh, the year in the program. So <clears throat> did a little photographing at the Collector's Edge before the uh, main show started. And Keith Proctor brought this piece up for me to shoot. Uh, Crocoi from the Red Lead Mine in Dundas, Tasmania. Um, 9.3 centimeters high. Now, when I actually got to the main show, uh, Jeffrey Morrison showed up again with more beautiful cut tourmalines from the Havy Mine in Maine. The largest stone there, top center, is 10.64 carats. Spurifer from uh, Warsaw, Poland, brought me this lovely piece, an azurite malachite from Marinci, Arizona, 3.8 centimeters high. Also from Spurifer, this is cobaltian uh, calcite from the Agudal mine in Bozer, Morocco. The large crystal there is 1.4 centimeters. So a little over half an inch. I think you know who this person is, Mary. <laughs> anyway, David Herskowitz brought me this uh, pretty spiffy labradorite from Madagascar, 20.4 centimeters high. I think he brought me like four pieces and this was just probably the, the prettiest of all the pieces. As a local fellow who's not a collector, dealer or anything, he actually is, his business is dealing in used medical equipment, but he is a rather OCD um, machinist and he makes works of art out of these computer guided machines. And he takes blanks of uh, aluminum and cuts bizarre things out of them like this uh, sort of uh, aluminum pseudomorph after ammonite, we'll call it that. Anyway, 30.8 uh, centimeters high, so just over a foot high by Mark Zarinsky. Anyway, after the show, I went up to see uh, Marty Zinn. He lives up in Evergreen Mounds, which is the mountains, uh, up in the mountains northwest uh, west of Denver. Been shooting for Marty for probably close to 30 years. And <clears throat> this is a, a, what they call the bird's nest. It's a silver with calcite from Kongsberg, Norway, 9.2 centimeters wide. Um, a piece from the Collector's Edge, euclase with albite and fluorapatite from the La Marina, or excuse me, the La Marina mine in Boyacá, Colombia, 3.6 centimeters high. Now I'm trying to think. I think I headed finally get headed home after the show in late September, and went down to Tucson and did some shooting for Peter McGaw. Peter McGaw is a uh, geologist specializing in. Uh, mining ventures in Mexico, and he collects exclusively Mexican minerals. So this is a classic ram's horn gypsum from the west camp of Santa Eulalia, Chihuahua, Mexico, 10 centimeters high. Also Peter's collection, uh, another classic wolfenite from uh, Los Lamentos, Chihuahua, 8.7 centimeters high. Another collector down there quite well known, used to collect nothing but sumap minerals. Now he, he specializes in basically South Africa and Namibia, but he's also a dealer and he got some of, some of the best uh, stuff from the Milpias mine, uh, including this brochantite, which is 6.3 centimeters wide. And just to note <clears throat> from another <clears throat> OCD kind of purist guy, it's not the Milpilas mine, it's the Milpias mine. Double L in Spanish is pronounced as a Y. So that's your lesson for the day. And I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, photographed a bunch of, <clears throat> excuse me, 
really nice cabochons from Rare Earth, which is a dealership back in uh, Connecticut. And uh, this is a quartz cabochon shot full of rutile, 23 by 39 millimeters. Late October, it is off to my, my usual pilgrimage to the Munich show. I usually just go to do the show, but I've gotten wise lately and decided I've actually got to go a little early and hit some of my clients and make a couple bucks and make the trip uh, pay for itself. Anyway, Munich show is phenomenal. It's the second biggest show in the world. Um, and if anybody from the Tucson club is watching, well, excuse me, but they knocked the, two, the, the pants off of the Tucson club for the quality of their displays and the way the show is run. It's phenomenal. But unlike the, Den the Tucson show, and I understand this is an issue, the Tucson show is run by a club. The Munich show is run as a business. And <clears throat> they put some serious money into this. <clears throat> anyway, they have a special exhibit area and uh, a theme every year. And this one was precious stones. And they actually had a crystal. And next to each crystal was a cut stone of the same material. So this is the entry to the, uh, the special exhibit area. And each one of those cases holds a rough and a cut, tourmalines, aquamarines, morganites, sapphires, you name it. As you can see right here, smaragd is the German word for emerald. Aquamarine, I think you know what that is, and barrel too. So on the left is probably the finest matrix emerald ever to come out of North Carolina. And the piece on the right, is uh, from Colombia with a large, very fine, uh, looks like almost a 42 carat emerald. In the area between the buildings, they always have all sorts of interesting things. Sometimes there are uh, dinosaurs. Sometimes we have uh, cavemen here attacking a uh, bogged down <laughs> woolly mammoth. There is always a special exhibit devoted to fossils. This one looks like it's the fossils of the Green River Formation of Southwest Wyoming. They also had a subspecial exhibit, the minerals of uh, the Trentino Alps in Italy. Wonderful exhibit. I mean, the quality of the exhibits here will blow your mind. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, the area is known as uh, Tessin or Tacino in Italian. One of the pieces I shot there, this is a really superb almost five inch high tanzanite crystal from Marilani, Tanzania from Hong Kong collector, Sam Young. And it wasn't long after this that I went over to Hong Kong and spent several days photographing for Sam. <clears throat> anyway, another piece for Brice Cobain. Right across the side from the Entwining Mine in South Africa, 13 centimeters across. Kind of an odd habit for Red Crow site from that locality. Will Larson, Bill Larson's son, I probably don't have to tell you that, was there with his dad and he got one of the superb smoky courses out of the famous Rufibach pocket uh, in Singenstock, Switzerland, 11.5 centimeters high. That is a gorgeous piece. After the show is over, oh, well, this is one of the times I actually use my brains. I went over and did some shooting over near Ido Oberstein and it is Idar Oberstein, not Oberstein. There's my soapbox again, sorry about that. Anyway, <clears throat> the gem cutting center of Germany and possibly all of Europe. Anyway, there's a dealer there by the name of uh, Eckhart Schneider and uh, his primary business is very fine quality cutting of stones and their sale. So I spent a few days there photographing for him. So this is a 7.99 carat ruby, don't have a locality. Um, these are all tourmalines from Namibia. The largest one is 7.8 centimeters. Uh, that should be carats, not centimeters. If that was centimeters, that would be world-class. I'll have to uh, do a little editing on this program someday. Uh, also from his uh, stock collection, uh, again, a rough and cut, Elbite tourmaline from Namibia, nine centimeters high and 32.3 centimeters uh, carats. Nigerian tourmalines, 6.6 .6 centimeters and uh, 5.8 centimeters. Don't have any carat weights on the stones. 
I was remiss that day. Spesser teens from Nigeria. These are exquisite things. I think they call, they call them in the business Mandarin garnets. The larger piece on the left is 22.17 carats. Another local fellow is probably one of the finest carvers in the world of um, <coughs> uh, gem materials by the name of um, Gert Dreyer. This is one of his pieces. Gert passed away about two and a half years ago now. Uh, amazing, amazing work. This is carved out of agate. Eyes are probably onyx, 12.3 centimeters wide. And uh, this is in the collection of Eckhart Schneider. And just so as you know, uh, I am working, I've done the photography for a book that is now being put together on the carvings of not just Garrett Dreyer, but his son, his father, and his grandfather and great-grandfather. Five generations. Great-grandpa worked for Fabergé and the Czars back turn of the century. <clears throat> One day we decided we had to do a little picnic, went out to a property that Eckhart owns outside of the town and uh, it's fall in late October. This is rare. Usually when I go to the Munich show, it is gray, cold, damp, and disgusting. We had a beautiful fall day, did a little barbecuing there outside of Kirschweiler. Anyway, I got home did some photography for uh, Adam Neely Fine Jewelry, who has uh, two shops, one in Fallbrook, well, Fallbrook, Laguna Beach, and the other in San Francisco. So this is a, a pair of earrings with uh, diamonds, topaz, and gold, white gold. The large drops are blue topaz. <clears throat> and again, sometime you can ask me how I got those to hang in midair. Then there was a quick run up to Butte, Montana to photograph this exquisite necklace is an old, old piece from, I think the, <coughs> excuse me, 1800s, emeralds, diamond, and platinum, a uh, private collection uh, from uh, a royal family in uh, Europe. I won't say any more than that. It's top secret. And there's a collector up in Prescott, Arizona by the name of Steve Maslansky. A uh, very nice collection, nice guy. This is fluorite with quartz from the Huanggang mines in Inner Mongolia, China, 6.6 .6 centimeters wide. And back at my place, there's a local fellow by the name of Tom Dodge. He goes up to Glass Butte in Oregon and collects, he may be the only source for this amazing material. It's obsidian, it's not opal, it's not, uh, he calls it fire obsidian, and it's very difficult to photograph. This ended up being uh, a cover of a British gemology journal and uh, inside was an article we illustrated with my photographs of other pieces from this uh, locality. And uh, Tom not only collects it, but he cuts and polishes it. Let me see, I think I made another trip back down to Southern California that year. This is Adam Mike from the Ojuela Mine, Durango, Mexico, Irv Brown collection, 4.8 centimeters high. One of the nicest I've seen from here. Also from Irv's collection, this is a Morganite from the White Queen Mine in Pala, California, 7.8 centimeters high. And uh, a little bit further south in San, well, San Diego, Joe and Susan Kilbasso. Uh, this is a fluorite, Hardin County, Illinois, 6.4 centimeters wide. Back up to Fallbrook, uh, Rose Quartz on pale smoky quartz with uh, some tourmaline from Araswai, Minas Gerais, Brazil. Larson collection, 4.8 centimeters high. Over to the Graber's house again. This is considered by many to be the finest miniature ever to come out of the San Francisco mine. Wolf and Night with Mimetite. Uh, Kareth Graber's collection, 4.9 centimeters across. Oh, Northwest, <coughs> excuse me, Pacific Palisades, collector by the name of Conan Barker. And uh, he likes collecting big stuff. Uh, this is not terribly large at only 10.2 centimeters, that's four inches. Gold from the De Maria mine, Placer County, California. Also Conan's collection, a, another butterfly twin calcite with a dusting of hematite. Egremont, Cumbria, uh, England, 10 centimeters wide. 
and uh, got home. I did a little shooting. Let me see. Yeah, this 15. Collector down near Melbourne, Melbourne to uh, most folks. Matthew Webb is a collector down there. <clears throat> and this is some of the, what they call cactus quartz from Magdaliasberg, South Africa, 13 centimeters wide. He had a bunch of specimens that had been left uh, in a storage unit in uh, Phoenix. And I photographed a bunch for him uh, for a publication he'd been planning on at the time. And that is one year in my life, folks. Hope you enjoyed it and I didn't keep you too terribly long. Are we, uh, are we all on now? Turn your mics back on. Yeah. Wow, that was amazing. Oh, I have a boring life. <laughs> <laughs> How many miles do you think you travel a year, Jeff? If it wasn't COVID? Because this is a weird year. You haven't gone anywhere except Houston and Houston. Yeah, I, I fly a lot, but I'm sure the majority of my, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my mileage is, uh, yeah, driving uh, my forerunner. Uh, I don't know. I do keep, well, my total mileage per year, which is probably 99% for business, is 31,000 miles. Wow. <laughs> plus, plus what you fly. And then on top of that, add the flying. And of course, I have no idea. I get to Europe, I get to Australia, wherever I am, I rent a car and I'm driving around like a maniac too. So no idea what that kind of mileage is. Mm. <laughs> Try not to keep track of it. All right, go, probably go nuts. It's scary. I haven't, I have done not quite that pace, but close enough. And it's like, you don't even remember where you are half the time. And you, you can remember the rocks, but you don't even remember what town that was in. Yeah, I wake up in the morning sometimes and go, it takes me a moment or two to remember where the hell I am. <laughs> wow. Jeff, we have a few questions in the comments. Um, sure. I saw um, one from Carol and one from me um, in the chat. Um, can you open that up or do you want me to read them off to you? Oh, let me see if I can find the chat. Here it is at the bottom. It looks like yeah. questions. How do you balance <laughs> like that spinel? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, something that's very pointy in the bottom like that, I might have had, you know, if you know, if if the gods are smiling on me, it sits by itself. Obviously, the spinel is not going to. Um, sometimes I use I use putty, a certain putty. Uh, the kind that you get that they call mineral tack or whatever in a Staples, you know, office supply store. Uh, but that wouldn't work for that either. Sometimes I'll take a little piece of corrugated cardboard, cut it in kind of a, a, a triangular shape and glue it or putty it to the glass and then putty or glue it to the back of the crystal. Um, sometimes I'll take a paper clip and unfold the paper clip just partially so it's kind of a V-shape. And one side of it is attached to the glass and the other side to the back of the crystal. So whatever works. And sometimes don't you go back in and have to erase things that might be shown digitally? Yeah, once in a while my support, as hard as I try, does show a little or there's a little putty or a little shadow of it. And then I can take it out with Photoshop. Um, <clears throat> remember when I showed that beautiful um, Stib Night spray from Steve Smell's collection. That was not photographed standing up like that. Again, the wonders of Photoshop. That was actually photographed lying down, completely horizontal, on a sheet of glass. Almost all of these are photographed before that question gets asked. I photograph, I, I have a piece of 18 by 24 inch non glare picture framing glass, horizontal, held up on a little stand about 18 inches above the table surface. And on its far side, opposite the camera, hanging down is a piece of paper that become, becomes the background. And it gets lighted separately. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, where was I going with that? Um, oh yeah, uh, sticking up from the glass on the far side, I will have a piece of uh, tissue paper basically hanging. 
and that will have a light behind it. It creates a halo that reflects off of the glass. So when you see something like that, that spinel crystal, that neutral halo around it is caused by light reflecting off the glass from the opposite side from the camera behind the piece and above the glass. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> reflects off the glass <coughs> and produces a neutral halo. And the paper hanging below it is black. So you get a nice black grating to a, you know, kind of a neutral halo. Anyway, the problem is that sometimes uh, you can't see the putty from the camera direction, but you can see its shadow. So that causes a little bit of a problem. But getting back to the stibnite, instead of having the tissue back there, I just had black underneath on the far side below the glass. I laid it down. And the nice thing about shooting on glass is I can have reflectors left, right, behind, and below it shining up through the glass. So I can light all those crystal faces which are angled downward, which you couldn't do if you had it on a solid, you know, opaque background. So once I've taken it, and it's against a black background, which makes it easier to select out with Photoshop, I flip the page, the picture 90 degrees after I've finished doing whatever I need to do to it. <clears throat> and then I uh, completely change the background. And it is a real background. I keep a library of actual backgrounds. You know, I could shoot a piece, then take another shot of it, removing the subject and cleaning the glass again. So I have a library of real backgrounds with halos in different positions, sizes, shapes, or uh, colors. So that's how I did that piece. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, second question, reflections highlight the pieces beautifully. What is the surface? Well, I guess I already answered that. <laughs> yeah. Glass. yeah. What you have to be careful with it. I try and be careful as possible, but after a while, you get scratches and little dinks on it, which, uh, if they're not too many, are fairly easy to remove with Photoshop. But after a while, you reach a point where there are just too many scratches and it's driving you insane. And I take the glass and turn it for end to end. And until that end gets scratched up, then you can throw out the glass and get a new piece of glass. <laughs> so I go through a number of sheets in a year. Wow. Do you ever have any trouble when you go through customs and you have to say, why well, uh, you've got this glass in your bag? Well, it gets carried. The, the, the stand that I photograph on folds up into a carrying case that's about six inches, seven inches thick by about, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, a little over two feet square. And the stand fits in there as well as my paper backgrounds, as well as two sheets of glass and a couple of other odds and ends. <coughs> They've never given me grief about that. Of course, sometimes the baggage manglers have broken the glass by treating it like it's a Frisbee. But um, uh, sometimes I get grief about my equipment. Usually the most aggravation I get is coming back to the States. Interesting. But of course, I've, I've minimized most of that aggravation now because I have duplicated all of my equipment in Europe. I get friends in Germany, I leave it with. So I fly in with hopefully a suitcase, a laptop, and a camera bag, pick up my stuff after I get my car rental, <coughs> and start running around. But there are times, for instance, when I fly to Australia or, or um, Hong Kong or something, where I do bring the setup that I keep in Phoenix with me and that travels around with me to shows in the US. A stand that uh, Jeff is talking about, he custom designed so that he has it to his specifications. And he's gonna be trying to do a new one, I understand. I have almost completed another one. <clears throat> I'm hoping to have the Mark IV completed tomorrow. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm actually building two of this, this latest model, one that can stay in Houston. <clears throat> Excuse me, it can stay in Houston where I now have kind of a regular gig shooting for them five days each month. And then another one that can uh, travel with me. So every time I build one, I, I put in, I design new features, drop old features, modify it and try and improve it every time I make it. And Didn't I think- you get the message you were supposed to build a third one for us? Hmm. I think I deleted that one by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, when I start using the new one, you can have my old one. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. Believe me, I've had a number of people traveling in Europe here and there saying, 
can you make these things? Can I buy that one from you? You know, I said, no, 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 it's not going to happen. No, no, no. They, people don't understand what it takes to make a specialized piece of equipment like that. And yeah, again, you're saying you're on the fourth version of this. Right. You know? So and I've been shooting on something, basically this kind of an eye, for 25 years I've been shooting on something like this. So um, <clears throat> uh, I used to have my own woodwork, custom woodworking business. And uh, I would help people refine their ideas and then figure out how to make it in a production mode. And I'm sure if I had to make these in a production mode, I could get the cost down now. But when I'm making only one or two, it would cost thousands of dollars for one of these damn things. Yep. <laughs> but I'm making it for me, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was really to... interested, Jeff, to see um, so many successful photos, but I noticed there weren't any failures. And I know you have a great deal of experience, but do things ever go wrong? Do you think I would actually include a failure in a, in a program? <laughs> <laughs> a teaching failure? Actually, I do a lot of programs and uh, particularly teaching about photography. And there, particularly when I used to shoot film, there were failures, like a specimen falling over in the middle of an expo exposure. Not necessarily get hurt or anything, but in the middle of a long exposure, so you have this slow-mo blur across the field of view of a tourmaline toppling over, or <coughs> a, a card falling into the field of view. And actually, I loved showing those pieces because it shows you something about how the picture was taken. It shows you that I am far from perfect, that we all make mistakes. It's always worth a laugh to include a shot like that. Um, but yeah, no, I, and I, whenever I'm taking shots, uh, uh, not often, but if I'm shooting particularly something different or unique, I will take, I always have several cameras with me and I'll take pictures of the setup and close-ups of the details of how things are propped, how things are lighted, so that I can use them in a teaching program down the road. So, um, but generally the neat thing about photographing digitally is, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little problem with acid reflux. So uh, anyway, <clears throat> is I, uh, I can take a picture, I get the thing set up, it looks like it's right, I'll take the picture, and I shoot, as they say, tethered to my laptop, my computer. Within probably a second of taking the picture, it is on my computer. And I can look at it and see, oh, I like this, I don't like this. I need to move the halo up or down or left or right or bigger or smaller or brighter. Uh, light this face more, light this face less. Uh, light a face that isn't lighted. Uh, there's a piece of lint on top of the crystal whatever. So I can refine the picture. In general, you know, uh, it's very rare I get the shot, bingo, right on the first shot. Very rare. One out of, you know, 500 shots, maybe. I would have to say it takes me an average of maybe 10 shots, tweaking it to get it to where I like it. And each one of those uh, one through nine gets trashed. And I only keep the finished perfect one. I wouldn't say it's perfect because it's rare that I can look at a picture. I'll go back and look at shots I did last year or last week and look at them and go, God, I wish I'd done something different to it. I'm mm -hmm. not sure there's a single shot I've ever taken that I would consider perfect. And hopefully that's the case because that means you never stop learning and trying and trying to get better. How hard Have you? Oh. Oops, go ahead. Have you ever met a mineral that you couldn't get a good likeness of? It's rare, but some of them really challenge me. I'll tell you that. Some are very difficult. Dioptase is difficult because usually too damn many crystals, extremely reflective, extremely dark, and digital in particular hates the color of green that a dioptase is. It doesn't reproduce it properly. And you got to try and tweak it in Photoshop afterwards to get a, some... A, anything remotely close. Uh, emeralds are also miserable for that case. They're not as hard to light because of reflectivity and all that, 
but the color is horrible on them. Um, and of course, there's ones that just pre pre present physical challenges. How do you prop it up? Uh, you How know. do you make them float? <laughs> well, again, they're just, they're sitting on the glass. Hmm. If I want to, if you notice the ones with the neutral halos often have a fairly dark kind of a combination reflector and, and halo in front of them on the glass. Hmm. And that's caused by having that light behind them producing the halo. Now, another way I do it is instead of that diffuser on the far side, opposite the camera, I hang a piece of black paper there, which makes sure I get, don't get reflections off the glass from behind, like the wall or whatever. And <clears throat> hanging below the glass on the far side, I have a piece of colored paper. I have a light under, basically between the legs of the tripod, below the camera, aimed underneath the glass at that piece of colored paper. And then I get a colored halo in the background. And when I do that, you do not get that heavy shadow reflection. You may get a reflection, but it's going to be very soft and diffused. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I did show you a few pictures like that, but you're probably not going to remember it. Um, in which case they, case, they look more like they're floating. Oh, okay. And if I want to, I can make them float 100%. You can remove the reflection on the glass by using a polarizing filter over the lens. You rotate it until the reflection disappears. And it looks like the thing is floating in space. Cool. <laughs> yep. I don't do that often because I think having a little reflection, a shadow or something, it, it puts the specimen in a context. It puts it on something. Uh, I've had comments. I did do quite a bit of that years ago when I first started doing digital. And some people complained that it made them feel uneasy, that the piece was floating in space. They want to feel like it's grounded, it's on something. Hmm. So it's not often I do that technique, but I do have one client who absolutely detests any kind of reflection or shadow under the piece. So her shots are always done with a polarizing filter. So they totally float. He's the only one who requires that. And how hard was it for you to switch from film to digital? It was a difficult transition. And mostly because uh, people don't tell you really that there is a major difference. They, you like to think that it comes straight out of the camera finished. It does not. And for about two years, I fought with it and cursed, turned the air blue, and publishers were driving me crazy, and they were going crazy and wondering, Jeff has gone to hell. His pictures stink now. And <clears throat> um, <clears throat> finally found out that just like film, film has to be processed. Digital photographs have to be processed. Even if you're not changing a background, flipping at 90 degrees, even if you're not stacking, they have to be processed. Um, the camera, the, the shot that comes straight out of the camera when you're shooting raw images, which is what you have to do if you're gonna be remotely serious, is they're lacking in saturation, they're lacking in sharpness, they're lacking in contrast. Um, you have to put all of that in, and then as long as you're at it, you're gonna go over that glass and magnification, remove their, any dust that's on the glass, um, if it's an emerald, you're going to have to tweak the color to try and get it close to where it is. So all photographs taken digitally need to be processed. Less processing can be, uh, is necessary if you're going to shoot just in JPEG mode, because a lot of those adjustments are done in the camera, but only in the JPEG, not to a raw shot. And there's advantages, many advantages to shooting in raw as opposed to JPEG. So actually, if you do, you know, you got a setting that, that you can put shoot JPEG or shoot t or just raw or shoot JPEG and raw. Well, if you take the raw and the JPEG and put them right next to each other, the exact same shot, the JPEG is going to look better because the adjustments that you do in your menu on the camera affect only the JPEG. And what you're trying to do is get the raw shot to look more like the JPEG or even better by processing. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> but 
Uh, anyway, not to get into why that why you shoot in raw at the moment, but there's a there's a really good reason for it. <laughs> well, the other thing is is in terms of for publication and color separations and all the rest of that, uh, it works better. Yeah. Well, you know, you don't send raw shots to a publisher, but you send them. Well, interestingly enough, the raw shot that comes out, it gets processed and it gets turned into two other things generally, a TIFF and a JPEG. A TIFF is a high resolution uh, image that both of them contain all the image, the adjustments you made. But the JPEG is very high resolution. The, I mean, the TIFF is high resolution, the JPEG is not. Right. Strangely enough, Rocks and Minerals, Mineralogical Record, Mineralia and Velp, and Lapis in Germany all publish their pictures from JPEGs. That's different. Which is kind of weird. It is weird. But if you're doing a book, you're going to want the TIFF files. The TIFF file is what you should be working on for maximum quality. Right. And I said I wasn't going to get into it, but just really quickly, basically, a raw, a raw shot, when you take the picture, it's raw. All the information is in that picture, and you tweak it and play with it to produce your final shots, a JPEG or a TIFF. A TIFF it does not matter how many times you copy that TIFF, reproduce it, send it, or anything, it will stay the same quality. A JPEG is a Reader's Digest condensed version of the shot. It superficially looks the same, but it's been gutted. And every time you copy it, send it, or send it or whatever, you lose data. So if you could take that shot and dupe it 10 times and put it next to the original one, you're gonna see it's lost resolution, uh, color saturation, a lot of things will not be as sharp. So this is what's called, uh, a JPEG is what's called lossy. It loses data. A right. TIFF does not. So uh, if you can modify it as much as you want with Photoshop, but you just gotta remember that if you wanna reproduce it any further beyond that or any more than once or twice, you're gonna start degrading your image but not with a TIFF. <clears throat> so if you shoot only in JPEG in your camera, you can tweak it and Photoshop it all you want, but do not expect that thing to reproduce over and over again with the same quality. So that's why you shoot raw. The raw, you can play with till the cows come home and turn it into a TIFF and you'll always keep the same quality, not a JPEG. So. Anyway, there's that. <laughs> now, if members are interested in enrolling in one of your classes, Jeff, how would they contact you? Well, I actually have not had a class in a number of years. I used to have a uh, run a workshop at the Tucson show. <clears throat> uh, three years, it was a three years in a row. I did a three day workshop along with Michael Bainbridge. He tended I did all the basic stuff and lighting and setup and backgrounds and cameras and all that stuff. And he concentrated on um, uh, Photoshopping and micromount photography. Anyway, it was a wonderful thing to do, but we ran out of a, we, we lost our space to do it at Tucson. Mm -hmm. I have had people come and spend a day with me at my studio in Phoenix for a one-on-one -on -one, and that can be done. Great. It ain't free. <laughs> I have done it. It's priceless. Yeah, if yeah. someone wants to do that, I can do that. As far as contacting me goes, uh, they can reach me easily on my email, which is just simply Jeff Scoville at earthlink.net. Okay. Thanks. And uh, we'll, we'll, <clears throat> put that, we'll put that on our website uh, along with this on YouTube so that people can see it and they'll also be able to find you. Right. So you can always email me that way. If someone wants to do that, fine. Uh, sometimes when I'm shooting at a show, of course not COVID now, uh, people are welcome to hang out and watch me. Uh, and I may not explain everything in detail that I'm doing, but they can hang out and watch mm -hmm. as long as they don't get in the way. <laughs> so you don't have a YouTube channel? No, uh, you know, I ought to. Look uh, how much traveling he's doing. I don't think you could sit down and do one more photographic thing. <laughs> yeah, no time, no time. Um, 
one, uh, I did write a book called Photographing Minerals, Fossils, and Lapidary Arts back in 1995, published by Geo Science Press. It has been out of print now for probably 15 years. You can occasionally find it on Amazon or some of the dealers who sell used mineral books and whatnot at the shows. Uh, it sold for years for $40. The cheapest I've seen it since then was 75 and as much as 400 Wow. Uh, I <laughs> am revising the book. I'm hoping within a couple of years to have it completely revised edition done completely in the context of digital photography. That'd be cool, Jeff. Yep. Yeah. So it's mostly rewritten, but there's a lot of the, 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 the pain in the neck work that has to be done, like new illustrations and references and, and uh, things like that. Um, so that's in the works. Uh, every year at the Tucson show, the first day of the show, Thursday afternoon from one to three, I do a mineral photography seminar. You get to just sit there and listen to what I'm, whether I'm talking uh -huh. about lighting or backgrounds or, or something. Uh, and so that's free. You don't even have to enter the pay for the show to do that. It's upstairs in one of the meeting rooms. Um, so I do that every year. Um, yeah. Um, on occasion, I give talks to clubs. Yeah, um, and you uh, hang your hat at La Fuente at Tucson time, so you can always find them working over there. Yeah. Um, anyway, I do sometimes give programs to clubs on basic introductory mineral photography. So you never know. But well, really, of course, the, the best way is the one-on-one -on -one teacher situation where you can have all my attention. And uh, um, that's the way to do it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, thank Jeff. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's always fun sharing. Yep. Yes, and you uh, have popped our eyes out. <laughs> yeah. Didn't show you any dogs. Uh, and, and when things get um, COVID, not COVID free, but at least relaxed, and you, you come down to do a shoot in Fallbrook area, we'll have you probably do a few things from the museum. I actually am planning this spring to do a California and up the West Coast trip. So when I do that, I will let the usual suspects know. Okay, sounds good. I will ask you, I will add you to the suspect list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining thank us. Thank you. Yeah, thank it you. It was great. Much, Jeff. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, you you have a an amazingly interesting career. <laughs> that it is, and I'm not about to retire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could have could have would have should have, but no, I'm gonna hang in there. Good. Oh, More yeah. rocks to photo. <laughs> well, it's it's a good community to hang around with, so yep. we appreciate it. It's 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 a care. It's a it's a community full of wackos, weirdos, interesting people, <laughs> reprobates, and you name it. I don't know what you're talking about. Category. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. everybody. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Mary, are you calling it officially? Um, I'm at, uh, what is it, 8.48 p.m. 8.48, thank you. I just have to record it for our secretary. And, and we thank have you. recorded the whole thing, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Will you please send me the link, and I'll include that in the minutes. Okay, will do. Thank you. Um, and then I'll submit them to you to review. Um, and you can just get back to me. I'll see you at the committee meeting on Saturday. Saturday. Is that right? Does that still work for you? I, yeah. Okay. I didn't know if the um, the weather was going to affect your travel plan. So no, I'm leaving Sunday, so it should be fine. Okay. All right. All but right. we're meeting Saturday. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.